Okay, so we're going to continue our study. We've been studying uh, the churches, okay? And so we're, we're going to continue that. Today, I'm not going to be able to get through all of, and your pastor is doing a really bad job here. Wow. I'm so unprepared. Can you believe it? my Bible up here. Oh, okay. All of a sudden realized I didn't have it up here. But I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Uh, we're, we're not going to try to do all of Pergamum because there is a lot in here, okay? There's a lot to look at. And uh, I, I was studying it out and I said, you know what, we're going to stop halfway through here because I don't want to, there's just so much I don't want you to miss out on some of the things we can learn from this uh, from this church. So if you'll turn in Revelation chapter 2, uh, we're going to be reading verses 12 through 17. And uh, if you go ahead and stand, we'll read this passage. So starting in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, brother brother um, Beamster, could you, could you lead us in prayer this, this afternoon? Amen. Okay, you may be seated, and uh, we're going to get right into this. So, you know, we've been studying uh, these seven literal churches, and I, I know I keep stressing that, but I want you to understand that these are actual churches that existed, okay? And so we can learn from them. And um, God sends a message to each of these seven churches. They're all, you know, they all existed within the same Roman providence of Asia. And it's so, as we look through these churches, I mean, it's pretty fascinating that there's so much difference between these seven churches. I mean, some of them are really going forward for God, and then others are not going anywhere for God. And yet, we're, we're really just at the end of the first century, okay? So the church, as far as the New Testament church, it's only been in existence at this point for approximately, you could say, about 50 to 60 years. And there's already this much difference in these different churches, okay? Which helps us understand a little bit about why we see what's going on in our world today, okay? You know, sometimes people are like, well, why all these different churches? Well, I mean, this is how it's been right from the beginning, and a lot of it's because of sin, okay? Because like it or lump it, we're a bunch of sinners, okay? <laughs> and we cause a lot of trouble, okay? And, but praise God, God loves us, and he reaches out to us, and he, even in our worst case, he still loves us. And that's one thing that we should take away from these churches is that as good or bad as these churches are, you know what? God loved them enough to try to reach them, okay? Try to speak to them. And that's something that as Christians, we need to be careful of. You know, you know, a lot of times as Christians, we can point our finger at this group or that group and say, you know, well, they aren't doing it just like us. Listen, be careful. I'm not saying we all need to get together, and I'm not talking about ecumenicalism, but be careful about, the Bible says, judge nothing before the time, okay? Let God work. The key is, what are we going to do about ourselves, okay? Don't worry about everybody else. What are we doing ourselves? 
Okay, so as we look here, you know, we, we first of all, we saw the church at Ephesus. I just want to review a little bit here. We saw the church at Ephesus. It was separated. It was hardworking, but they had forgot what? They had forgot their first love, okay? And that was a major problem. And because they had forgot the motive for what they were doing, all their dedication was just basically vain. And we see that today. There's a lot of churches that they're, man, they're, they're active and stuff, but they've forgotten what in the world they're doing it for, okay? They're just doing, going through the motions. We need to be careful about that. You know, when I think about that, I always think about Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter, four, in chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then, all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should henceforth live, un, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we a lot of times know that first verse, right? That last verse about, you know, uh, wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, things, all things are new. But you know what? All that that I just shared with you, it comes before that, okay? That's because of the love of Christ and what Christ has done for us and how he changed us. That's why we're a new creature. So, we are not, the key thing I'm trying to stress here is we are not a religion, okay? We're not a religion. We are those who have trusted in Christ and have been changed by him to do the works he has commanded us to do because of our love for Christ. Paul told the Corinthians in his first letter, and yet I show you unto you a more excellent way. And most of you know where I'm going, Okay. In the following chapter, he shows them that the, that works. This is chapter 13 of, of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Shows them that works without love for Christ are empty. They're vain. They're empty. And he ends the chapter with this summary. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. Of these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Okay? Charity is the sacrificial love that God demonstrates to us when he went to the cross and paid our sin debt while we were yet his enemies. It is his love that constrains us to live for him. And that's what I'm trying to get across. You know, a lot of people talk about the love, you know, let's be love, you know, we need love. And we do, okay? But the love of God should change us. Okay, love that doesn't change us is not love. That's just an excuse. Love should change us, and we should not be the same thing that we were. And so uh, that's the church at Ephesus. Now we have the church at Sardis. Now Sardis was a persecuted church, okay? It, Sardis was a church that they had lost all for Christ. They were willing to give all for Christ. God had nothing negative to say about this church. And the reason is because purification, I mean, I'm sorry, persecution had purified the church at Sardis. God's message to them was one of comfort. I know you're suffering. I have not forgotten you. And I know your enemies and they will not go unpunished. I know how much. He also said, I know how much you can bear and I will not allow more than you are able to bear. And can I tell you, that's a message that every one of us needs to hear. Because there's sometimes now we are not, you know, we're not going through persecution like the church as Sardis was going through. But can I tell you, there's days and weeks that are hard and they're difficult and we go through trials. And can I tell you, the same comfort that God gave us, gave the church at Sardis, he gives to us. Listen, he knows right where we are and he's gonna take care of us. If he could take care of them, he can take care of us. Today, we're gonna continue, go, we're gonna continue with the third church, the church at Pergamos, the compromising church, okay? Now, that doesn't sound very positive, and it's not, okay? 
I believe that this is where we find many of our biblical churches today. They're at the, they're at the threshold. They're at the, they're at the point of decision. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're, they're going to make a decision. And we're, as a church, we're at a point of decision. Are we going to go forward for God or are we going to compromise? And to be honest, you know, a lot of people are pushing compromise. You know, they're pushing, listen, why don't we just get along? You know, why stand for God? I, I've been reading through the book of Jeremiah. And if you've ever read through the book of Jeremiah, a lot of times Jeremiah, you can tell, he's just like, God, can we just, can I just, I don't want to do this anymore. You know I mean? I'm tired of just being everybody's beaten boy. You know I mean? Just getting beat up all the time. I just want to be at peace. And yet he can't. Because if he's going to stand for truth, he's always going to be attacked. And you know, I understand, don't get me wrong, I don't like being beat up and I don't like being attacked. I wish, I wish more people would come and, you know, all these things, you know, I want to be, I don't want to be everybody's enemy and I don't go, and you guys know me well enough that I'm not going out of my way to be anybody's enemy, okay? I figure, but the truth is if you stand for God, you're just not, there, there's going to be some separation. If you're going to say, I'm going to live for God, and it's not because you're being mean, it's not because you're being proud, it's not any of those things, it's just doing what's right. There's going to be people that aren't going to like you. There's going to be people that aren't going to want to hang around with you. And there's going to be people in the case of the church, there's going to be people that they're just not going to be willing to come to church. Not because the pastors mean, just because they don't want to hear the truth. But you know, if we love each other, we got to tell the truth, don't we? I mean, if you came here every week and I never talked about sin and I never talked about how we should live for God, are we really helping each other? Not really. We might as well just go home, right? And just live like everybody else. But you know, the whole point of coming to church is to challenge each other, encourage each other to grow. And unfortunately, I, like I said, a lot of churches are at this point where they're having to make a decision. And unfortunately, a lot of churches, I believe, are making the decision to compromise with the world in the effort to get, to get people to come. There is much to cover in these few short verses. So we are going to, like I said before, we're going to divide it in two parts. And I have a lot to share with you, and I hope it will be an encouragement to you. In our journey from church to church, we are heading north. So we're going to talk a little bit, like we've had every time, we're going to talk a little about where it is. If you look at the back of your Bible, you'll probably have a map section. You might be able to find Pergamos. But in our journey from church to church, we are heading north up the coast of the Aegean Sea, uh, coast of Asia Minor. Pergamos is located about 55 miles or 88 kilometers uh, north of Sardis. So as you can see, we started in Ephesus and we went to Sardis. We just kind of went up the coast. We went, we started in Ephesus and we went to Sardis. And now we're just going in just a little bit inland, but north of Sardis. So a total of 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. It was an ancient city and a powerful one too. Okay. Its location from the point of trade or any kind of, you know, like material wealth, it really was not a very strategic location. It wasn't a major crossroads. It wasn't a river or anything like that. But it had a very strong natural defensive position. And this is most likely why it was a very, it was originally founded and why it was so powerful. Okay. At one point, it, it literally controlled most of the providence of Asia as an independent kingdom. So at one time, it literally was the chief city in this whole area. Before the Romans came into uh, possession, it was ruled. It, it was ruled by a, a series of kings, and they had conquered this whole area all the way over to Galatia. If you remember in the Bible, we have the Book of Galatians. They had actually conquered all the way over into that area, and uh, as an independent state, it became very, very wealthy. Uh, it was known for its large library, so it was a seat of learning. As a matter of fact, it was the second largest library in the Mediterranean world. Uh, the only library that was larger was in Alexandria, Egypt. And at one time, it had contained over 200,000 manuscripts. That was until Cleopatra. If you've ever heard of Cleopatra, Cleopatra, during the time of the Roman civil wars and stuff, at one point, she was able to basically seize most of the library in Pergamos and carry it off to Alexandria because they were, Alexandria and, and Pergamon were in competition 
as seats of learning. So she carried it off. It was also very famous for its sculptures. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, sculptures that you see that people talk about are like the pinnacle of Greek sculpture. A lot of them were produced by sculptors in Pergamos. So it was a seat of uh, sculpting. It was also very important and it controlled most of the production of parchment, which is what they would have, would an equivalent of paper in that time. Okay, most of the parchment was actually produced in Pergamos and its surrounding area, and so it controlled that trade. Uh, it's kind of interesting that actually parchment, the word is actually a perversion of Pergamos. It literally means from Pergamos. Okay, that's what parchment means. So uh, we, we looked at the city and we saw some of the things that this city was famous for. But Pergamos was also a center for pagan worship, okay? It had an upper city that was set upon a mesa, okay, which a mesa is a flat top mountain, okay? A mesa, it had this mesa, and at some points, this mesa literally rose sheer a thousand feet or about 305 meters from the plain. So it was very, like I said, it was very naturally strong as a defensive position because literally the walls were on top of a cliff that was a thousand feet high. So it was very hard for an enemy to attack it. On top of this mesa was the Acropolis of the city, which was filled with temples to a multitude of gods. The city was the center for the worship of the Greek god of healing. And I think I'm going to say this right, but I may so I think it's Acephalus, okay? Acephalus, you've, if you don't know who it is, you've actually seen him before because his symbol is a snake wrapped around a, sta a staff which is what you see, a medical symbol in the hospitals and stuff. That is his symbol. Now, how he, he, was, he, was, he had temples around the world, but there was a large healing temple in Pergamos. And people would come from all over to come to Pergamos to this healing temple. Now, what did they do there? Now, they did use medicines and things like that. But one of the big things they did is they would encourage the faithful to sleep in the temple at night. Okay, and they would sleep there and they had all these big snakes. Has anybody seen the, the cephalus snakes here? They're actually the native here, okay? They're these huge, long, I mean, they're, they could be as long as this platform and they're green. They're usually like a green gray. But if you see one, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're huge, okay? So you can imagine they would put, they'd say, okay, go ahead and sleep here in the temple and these snakes would crawl over them during the night and they were supposed to impart healing because they were the personification of the God. Okay? Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand, we understand a lot of this is kind of hocus pocus and whether or not it really did anything, but understand that Satan is very real. Okay? Satan is very real. And he can deceive people. He can make them think that these things happen. He is very powerful. So don't ever doubt that Satan is able, and we see it even today, you know, people claim they can do things like this. Listen, be, be very, very careful, okay? God is able to heal, okay? But the time of, you know, people coming and doing, it, that's, what are we commanded to do? If we're sick, what are we supposed to do? Gather as a church and pray over the brother or sister who's sick, anointing with them with oil and trusting that God, it's not the oil that heals, it's just what God has commanded us to do, okay? And I do believe that, that I, my wife had brain cancer, Okay, and we gathered the church together. They said she had seven years to live. It's been 21, 20, almost 22 years this year. 23 years this year. And God healed her. I'm in trouble, man. I got to check this out. Okay. 22. Okay, I was right. <laughs> okay, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, I'm not in trouble anymore. <laughs> okay. But, you know, God does heal. Okay. But he does it through the power of prayer. Okay, so be very careful about, you know, people who claim they have power. Uh, you know, Satan is able to do some pretty spectacular things, and he's been doing it for a long time. So, so, we, understand, so we see this, but uh, I just want you to understand that this city was very religious. Uh, this city was also, you remember, if you remember Sardis, it was very devoted to the god of Rome, right? Pergamus was the same way. So much so that the last king, when he died without heir, he actually, he actually bequeathed the city of Pergamus to Rome. That was what his will was. He wanted it to be part of Rome. And so they literally bequeathed the city 
to Rome when he died because they were so devoted to the pagan worship of Rome. Uh, now, however, I want to take you to one last religious site that Pergamus was famous for. As a matter of fact, in its day, it was considered one of the wonders of the world, and that was a large altar known even to this day as the Pergamus Altar. As you enter the religious district of Pergamus, this large altar dominated the landscape. It was gorgeously decorated with reliefs of gods fighting the giants. When they, when they say altar, understand it is more than just like an altar for sacrifice. You know, when we think of an altar, we think of something maybe like the size of this pulpit, and it's there. This thing was enormous, okay? And, and it wasn't just that little altar. There was an altar there, but it wasn't uh, the, the whole structure. It was very large. And I'm sharing this with you because this is important to understand our passage. It, it was made up of a base that was almost square, approximately 116 feet on a, on a side. So if you can kind of imagine that, that's a little bit hard to get a hold of, but that's about 30, 34 meters on a side. The whole structure stood about 40 feet high, or about 12 meters, with a large, a large uh, staircase that was about 65 feet wide that went up the front between two wings of the cannonade that sat on top of it. In other words, it was a bunch of pillars with a cannonade, basically performed like gave it like a canopy on top. And there was two wings that came out like this and the steps went up through it. And at the top was the altar. The actual altar, the structure of the altar, not, not the actual one they made the sacrifices on, can be seen today in Berlin, Germany at the Pergamus Museum. So if you ever go to Germany and you go to Berlin, go to the Pergamus Museum and you'll actually see the reconstruction of this altar. Okay? Now, from there we want to get, we want to get into the message to the compromising church at Pergamos. First of all, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like the two churches we have already studied, the message to Pergamos starts with a revelation of our Savior and head of the church. And that's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. It says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write these things, saith he, which hath the sharp sword and two edges with two edges. The church at Pergamus, they had lost, I'm sorry, the church at Ephesus had lost their first love and Christ reminded them that he was the center of the church. In other words, everything revolved around him, that he had authority over. The persecuted church was reminded that Christ is eternal and has won the victory over death. Okay? The compromising church is reminded that Christ is holding the two-edged sword we call the Bible and knows how to use it. It was actually, in a lot of ways, a threat. If you look at what he says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. While we know... It is not true. We often think that we can hide the contents of our heart from God. And what God is telling the church is, you can't. Okay, I know exactly what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're doing. He knows our hearts. This compromising church wanted to have a little both of the world and Christ. They wanted to get along. They thought God would be okay with that. But God is letting them know that he knows what's in their heart. And he doesn't like it. Now, let's look, first of all, in, in the verses, it's always interesting that God almost always, in almost every case of these churches, he still finds something positive to say about the church. And in, in the per church at Pergamos, it's the same thing. If you look, the commendation of the church, and we see that in verse 13, it says this, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Anapas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now there's a lot in that verse, okay? And we're going to try to unpack it a little bit and look at what he's talking about. As we will see, God almost always has something good, like I've already said about the churches. In the case of Pergamos, it was that they were holding fast to the name of Christ and their faith in him, even when their pastor Anapas 
was martyred for his faith. It was not an easy place to hold fast to the name of Christ. Because Jesus says the city of Pergamos was where Satan's seat was and that Antipas was slain where Satan dwelleth. We can learn a little bit about Satan from this passage. And I think it's important to take a few moments and consider what we can learn about Satan. First of all, Satan has a system of power in this world. You notice he's, it's where the seat of Satan is or the throne of Satan, and it's where he dwells. It talks about a system that Satan has. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This verse gives na us names for Satan's organization of evil throughout the world. From what God says about Pergamos, we can assume that the city at this time was Satan's seat or throne where he dwelt and ruled his spiritual empire of evil. See, Satan has a system in this world, and he is seeking to control this world, and he's seeking to destroy the cause of Christ. The second thing we can learn about Satan is that Satan is limited. He's limited to one place at a time. Many people are confused and think that Satan is maybe close to the power of God. That is what he wants you to think, okay? While he is more powerful than we are, he is also a created being, and it is not even, he is not even close to the power of God. God is everywhere at all times. Satan, like us, can only be at one place at one time. And this is one of those things I want to remind you. You know, sometimes we're like, well, Satan made me do it. No, trust me, Satan probably isn't messing around with you, okay? Now, he does have demons and other people that work, but you know, Satan is not following around most of us, okay? He can only be at one place at one time. Is everybody with me? He can only be one place. So we need to realize that we, he is our enemy, but many times it's not him directly that's dealing with it. He is limited. The other thing is that Satan is limited in power, okay? He's limited in power. This church was able to name the name of Christ and keep the faith even in the presence of Satan. Satan cannot touch the child of God without God's permission. His power is limited. We learn that from the book of Job. It's one of the great truths of the book of Job is that Satan's power is limited. He cannot do everything he wants to do. Now, before we go on, and this is really where we're going to spend the rest of our time, I want, I think it's worth digging a little deeper. And I'm not, listen, I'm not demanding that you accept everything that I'm about ready to share with you because the Bible does not specifically state all these things, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? But I think it's worth going into it because you'll understand a little bit more of what is going on in this world. I have learned by experience that there are no happenstance in this world. In other words, things don't just happen. They, there's a reason for them. God allows them to happen. History is moving to a determined conclusion that God has ordained. In other words, I'm not talking about that we're predestinated and there's no choice or anything. What I'm talking about is that God is moving human history to an end. And he's already determined what that end is. And he's moving it towards that part. Many have studied, many who have studied the large altar at Pergamos believe that it is the altar of Zeus, the head god of the Greek system. A statue of Zeus, and the reason this is interesting, is a statue of Zeus was placed by Antiochus Epiphanes in the temple in Jerusalem in 168 B.C. and is called the abomination of desolation by the Bible. This event pictures what the Antichrist will do in the temple at Jerusalem where at the halfway point of the tribulation, which we, talk, we talked about in Sunday school, he will declare himself God and demand the worship of the whole world. He will also cause an image to be built again in the temple, and that will appear to come to life. It appears that Satan associates himself especially with the god Zeus. It seems highly likely that the image to be built in the temple will again be a picture of Zeus. 
We can go even further. Anapas, the pastor of the church at Pergamos, according to tradition, the Bible doesn't tell us how he was martyred, but this is according to tradition. He was martyred by the use of a brazen bull altar. And you can look these things up. I, I'm not getting anything special. This, you can look these up in your history and you'll see what I'm talking about. These brazen bulls, I'm, I'm just sharing this with you because I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to study a little bit more and learn more about what the Bible's talking about because I think it helps us understand. These brazen bulls altars were used to kill criminals and were first used in Sicily. According to the descrip descriptions, the bull altar was a life-size hollow statue of bronze. On its side would be a door through which the victim was placed inside the statue. Then a fire was lit under the bull and the victim was roasted alive. To make the process more enjoyable for the spectators, incense would be added to cover the smell and a system of pipes was made in the nose of the bull, whereby the screams of the dying were turned into snorting like a bull. I know, pretty gory, but this is what they did to our fellow believers back in Roman times. Zeus is especially associated with the bull or oxen. If you've ever seen the picture of the European Union, they have Europa riding a bull. That bull is Zeus. That's how he stole away Europa. So you see there's a lot of interconnections with all these different things. We know that oxen were used in the religious rites of Zeus. In the Bible, we can actually find that. If we look in Acts chapter 14, and we're not going to read it, but you can look it up in Acts 14, when Paul and Barnabas preached at Lystra, the priest of Jupiter, that's the Roman name for Zeus, attempted to sacrifice oxen in honor of their presence because they thought that Barnabas was Jupiter or Zeus and Paul was Mercury after they had healed a crippled man. So it is very likely that Anipas met his death for Christ in a bull upon the Pergamos altar or Satan's seat where Satan dwelleth. However, the story of this altar does not end there. And that's what makes this so interesting. In the late 1800s, German archaeologists excavated the Pergamos altar and brought it back to Germany. Today, like I said already, it is in a museum in Berlin. You can actually go and see it. You can look online. You can see pictures of it also. Around 1930, a man, his name was Albert Speer, visited the museum in Berlin to view the same altar. He was inspired by the feeling of power that he had when standing at the top of the altar. This is what he said. I don't know if you know who he is, but you will in a minute. He went on to use the design of the altar to design and build the grandstand at the Zeppelinfeld in Nuremberg, Germany. Instead of a bull, Speer built a podium at the center of his grandstand for Hitler to speak to the faithful. Between 1933 to 1938, six Nazi party rallies were held there. They were not just rallies, they were religious rites to the cult of Hitler. It was here that Hitler announced the Nuremberg Laws, which started the process of dehumanizing the Jews and ultimately led to the Holocaust. It was here that he first used publicly the phrase, the final solution. We have a real enemy. And that real enemy is Satan. He's alive and well and seeking to destroy the work of God. We need to be vigilant. I shared that with you because just what I just said. You can say, well, Daniel, that's just a bunch of coincidence. I don't think it's coincidence. I think Satan is alive and well and he's doing exactly what he wants to try to bring about or attempt to undo what God is doing. We're going to stop here today. For too long, we in the West have forgotten that we have a real enemy. God warns us about him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 says this, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time 
casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto this, his eternal glory by, Je by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God warns us that we need to be sober and vigilant in this matter of Satan. We have rest. The truth is, in the West, we've had the great privilege of being at rest from the direct assault of Satan. We've had freedom to worship God. It seems to me that in the near future, our rest is going to be broken. It's time to be sober. It's time to watch. It's time for us to resist the temptation to compromise with this world and instead stand steadfastly in the faith that was once given by the fathers. It may mean we may suffer, but God will go with us all the way. The suffering of the church has always made the church perfected, established, strengthened, and settled. Next week, we'll continue on and we'll finish up this section on Pergamos, the church at Pergamos, and we'll look at the things that they were doing wrong. But as we leave today and we'll close in a word of prayer, I just want to challenge us as we go out this week, let's be sober, let's be vigilant, Let's recognize that we have a real enemy and he's really out to get us. But you know what? God is greater than him. So let's not live in fear, but let's trust God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, I thank you for these folks that are here and faithful and listening. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that you would put a hedge of protection about them. Lord, we're not looking for death but yet we want to stand for you, Lord. Lord, I'm thankful for those who are our spiritual forebearers, Lord, who stood for the truth, Lord. I even think of, in our recent history how many people have died for the faith, Lord, here in Europe and in America and around the world. And Lord, as a result of their faith, right now we've experienced this opportunity of freedom, but Lord, the truth is it's been a very rare commodity throughout history. Lord, help us not to be cold or indifferent. Help us not to become lazy. Help us not to be indifferent. Lord, help us first of all to be thankful. And then Lord, help us to be vigilant and to watch. And Lord, I pray that at the moment of our trial, Lord, that you would give us the faith that we need to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.